Please take your seats. We are going to begin by singing. I hope you can hear me. And the music group are going to sing, so please feel free to stand and join in as we sing to our God. Let's begin. do take your seats and uh, let me formally welcome you to this morning's service. My name is Brian, I'm part of the leadership team here at Emmanuel and I'm going to be guiding us through this morning's service. Let's begin with a word of prayer, let's pray together. Oh Lord God, we 
praise you this morning for who you are. Only a holy God we've just been seeing. We've been seeing come and worship. And that's what we want to do today. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we want to worship you. So, Father God, we ask that whatever we might have come with, whatever burdens today, whatever things might be distracting us, please would you help us to lay those aside. Give us hearts that want to worship you. Give us hearts that want to hear what you have to say to us through your word. As we sing to you and as we pray to you and as we listen to your word being preached, would all the things that we do glorify you because you alone are worthy. And we praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've just been singing and we're going to sing again. Um, The next song that we sing, I know some of the kids in Emmanuel really love or really enjoy singing this song. I know mine do. But some of the words are a little strange. If you look at them, it talks about blessed be your name. What does that mean, I wonder? Well, we're singing this song to God, we're speaking to him. And blessed means that we're trying to make a big deal of who God is. We're praising him because of who he is and because he is worth it. And the your name bit that you might notice, what does that mean? Are we really going to be making a big deal about God's name? I mean, what's in a name? My name's Brian, I could just easily be called Bob. There's nothing special about that. But in the Bible, God's names are special because they tell us something about who he is and what he does. So, for instance, for example, if you're reading your Bible and you come across the word Lord in capital letters, that's God's name, Yahweh. And that reminds us that he is holy, that he is gracious, and compassionate, he's slow to anger, and that he is overflowing with never-ending, always and forever love. That he is a God who loves to forgive. So in this song, what we're saying to him is that whatever God brings our way, whether it's the good times or the sad times, we're going to praise God because of who he is. So let's stand and sing and praise God.
Well, please do take your seats. Uh, we're going to come to a time of praying to God now, so Abby is going to lead us in those prayers. Let us pray together as your people. Father God, you are holy, you are perfect. And that is just such a wonderful thing for us. We don't deserve to know you or be your people. But you have made us our people, you have chosen us. Thank you that Jesus was perfect so that we didn't have to be, so that we could know you. Lord, we pray together as our people for our church. Thank you that we can still meet together in person. Lord, we long for this pandemic to be over. We're tired of the suffering and the anxiety and missing out on so many things. Lord, we pray that um, you will be merciful to us and your word. Lord, we thank you for our series in Elijah that we're starting off today. Thank you that we, we will see that you are a God who shows himself to us. Thank you that you have shown yourself to us. And we see his provision for his people. We pray that we would see that here too. Lord, we want to pray for our mission partner, Debs Hunt, along with Luke and Hugo, working for Cross Teach in Nottingham. Lord, they've got so much going on this term. They've got 60 lessons um, in year seven for, in schools. They've got lunch clubs and assemblies. And we do pray, Lord, that these will all be able to go ahead, um, that the young people would respond well to the things that are being taught. And we pray that they and we would see real fruit from their work. We also pray that you would provide um, all the finances they need, as there's still some outstanding. Um, we pray that you would, we would look upon this work and bless it. Lord, we want to pray for our world. Um, there's so many things going on in your world, some that we may not even realise because we just look at our little place in Nottingham. There are protests in Kazakhstan. There are refugees moving throughout Ethiopia. And there are all the migrants across Europe. We look at these things and we ask for your mercy, Lord, on these people. We pray that there will be justice for the oppressed. And we pray that your church in these places would be protected and would still be fruitful. And now as we come to listen to you speak through the Bible, help us to listen together to, as your people. Please help us to know who you are. We pray for the grown-ups in here and for all the children in their groups. We pray that you would really bless this time together. Amen. Well, it's time for you kids to go out to your kids' groups. Um, but before you do, let's pray. Father, thank you that you are a God who speaks. You're a God who speaks to us through your word. And whether we stay in the main hall here or whether we go off to our different classes in our different groups, please would you speak to us this morning. Please would you teach us about you. Please would you teach us about ourselves. And Lord, I ask that you would fill us with joy about Jesus and what he has done to rescue us. In whose name we pray. Amen. So we're going to go out in staggered. So if the uh, pebbles um, would like to make their way out to the foyer. Now I think it's time for, well not quite yet, time for rocks, time to go rocks, oh. Uh, 
and boulders. And yeah. And finally, rip wrap. Well, please do continue those conversations after the church service. We're just going to draw back together now. And uh, in a moment, we're going to be looking at the Bible and hearing what God has to say to us through that. And today we're beginning, as Abby mentioned in the prayers, we're beginning a new Bible series looking at the Bible books of 1 and 2 Kings and the life story of Elijah and seeing what it says to us about God. And one thing that we really are going to see is that there is no one quite like the God of the Bible. There's two main themes that are going to come out. The first is that there is one true God, that he alone is the one true God. And the second is to do with his word, that because he is the one true God, his word has power, that what he says happens, that the promises he makes, he keeps. And those are some of the themes that we're going to be singing about in our next song. So let's stand and sing.
please do take your seats. Well, we're going to be hearing from the Bible now, and Charlie is going to come up and read from 2 1 Kings. Um, so today we're going to be reading from 1 Kings, uh, chapter, 69, uh, 69, chapter 16, verses 29, to chapter 17, verse 6. Just give you a moment to find that in your Bibles. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Imri, Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sagub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Charlie, for your reading. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of receiving a direct word of judgment from God. You receive it, you march to the royal palace, declare it to the king or queen, and then disappear into the wilderness for a bit of R&R. Ever had that experience? No, nope. me neither. Which makes that passage that we've just heard feel pretty remote, Elijah suddenly appears on the scene, marches up to Ahab, king of Israel, declares a message of judgment from God, and then at God's command promptly disappears. I mean, who is this dude, Elijah, who just suddenly appears at the start of 1 Kings chapter 17? And how can he and his message possibly be relevant for us at the beginning of 2022? As a church family, we're going to be looking together at the life and ministry of Elijah from the end of 1 Kings and the beginning of 2 Kings. Those two almost certainly were one book originally. We're going to spend seven Sundays between now and the end of February doing that, and we'll be looking at these passages in our connect groups as well. And after the appetizer we've just heard, you may not be thanking me for that. Why are we doing this? Why not pick something a bit more obviously relevant to us and our situation. Well, Romans 15 in the New Testament says that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. One and two kings were written for our instruction, to teach us, for our benefit, to help us to endure that is to keep going in following Jesus. And they were given to encourage us, to give us hope. 
Let's pray it does all of those things. Let's pray now. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this section of your word. Please would you help us quickly to get to grips with it, to understand what is going on, to see how it's relevant to us. But most of all, we want to see you, that we might know you better. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We've given this preaching series the title, True False. And if you wanted the big message of this whole section in 1 and 2 Kings, and particularly the passage we're looking at this morning, it is the God of the Bible is the one true God. The God of the Bible is the one true God. Let's look together at the first verse Charlie read for us, 1 Kings 16, verse 29. Things will appear on the screen, so if you haven't got a Bible or a phone in front of you, have a look at the screen and and you'll see them appear. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. Now, as first verses of new preaching series go, you may feel that that is not the most promising of starts. It seems confusing. It has weird names, strange places, multiple kingships. What is going on? Please trust me when I say you can understand this and you can follow this. Let's try and and unpick it a little bit. At the beginning of 1 Kings, God's people lived in the land of Israel under King David, the great king. But the story of 1 Kings so far has been the story of God's people rebelling against him, and as a result, the kingdom has been divided. So in the map behind me, you can see Judah to the south in orange and Israel to the north in that kind of slightly worrying shade of green. Now, Judah had a king, Israel had a king. Verse 29 tells us that Asa was king of Judah and that Ahab became king in Israel. And the place that Ahab had in Israel as kind of centre of his operations was Samaria with the black ring round it. And the action in this bit of 1 Kings that we're going to be looking at is set in the northern kingdom of Israel. And particularly, we're going to look at the conflict between Elijah and Ahab, king of Israel, and then between Elijah and Ahab's son, Ahaziah. Now, the writer of Kings tells us straight away what Ahab was like. Verse 30 Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Now, that is some statement that he did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Because after the kingdom of Israel is divided, each of the kings of Israel is said to have done evil. Jeroboam, the first king of Israel after the kingdom was divided, he was almost a watchword for evil. He worshipped other gods. He caused God's people to do the same. Then Jeroboam was succeeded by his son Nadab. And Nadab, we're told, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the way of his father and in his sin, which he made Israel to sin. Basha followed Nadab. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, which he made Israel to sin. Next came Basha's son, Elah, who continued his father's evil ways. And then after a seven-day reign and a coup came Omri. Omri, 1 Kings 16, 25, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. There is, you have to admit, a definite pattern emerging here, isn't there? Evil follows evil follows evil. And when Ahab becomes king, 874 BC, he carries on the tradition and he more than carries it on. Given what's gone before, it's no small thing to say that Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who went before him. But the writer goes on to explain what that looked like. Verse 31. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, He took for his wife Jezebel, 
the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Baal was a god worshipped by Israel's neighbours. Ever since they'd entered the land, the Israelites had a long and sorry history of turning from worshipping the Lord also to worship Baal. And it had never ended well. But here with Ahab was the king of Israel who should have been ensuring that the people were worshipping the Lord, the covenant God of Israel. Instead, here he was worshipping Baal. Do you see how the writer drives it home in verses 31 and 32? He keeps saying Baal. He took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. God had said to his people not to intermarry with neighbouring peoples, but here is Ahab marrying the daughter of the king of the Sidonians. Maybe that's not so bad, we think. Except what's the king's name? Ethbaal, which means something like, Baal is my God. It's not sounding good. And it isn't good, because Ahab went and served Baal and worshipped him. And instead of tending to the temple of the Lord, as he should have done, he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And just to add to the evil of Ahab's Baal worship, verse 33, Ahab made an Asherah. Now, Asherah was a fertility god, the female equivalent of Baal. Now, we can see why it says in verse 33 that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. The Lord had called his people to worship him alone. And yet here was King Ahab building a temple for Baal and worshipping him and constructing an Asherah pole for worshipping her. Now, what would the appeal have been for Ahab and for the Israelites to worship Baal? If we don't grasp this, we won't see the danger there is for us here. You've opted to be here at Emmanuel Church Bramcote this morning. I'm sure... Going to Temple of Baal didn't even cross your mind this morning. But the Baal worship that attracted the Israelites, it wasn't actually primarily to worship Baal instead of the Lord. It was to worship Baal as well as the Lord. As we'll see in coming weeks, Queen Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, was aggressively anti the Lord. But, but in some ways she wasn't typical. Generally, the vibe of Baal worshippers was much more relaxed. Slightly, they'd have said to the Israelites, look, it's great that you worship the Lord. We really respect you for that. But of course, you can worship Baal as well as the Lord. Really? Yeah, 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 Baal's really great, you know. He's a fertility god, and he makes the crops prosper by sending rain. Did you know, by the way, that last year was the hottest year on record? Well, who doesn't need a bit of crop blessing at times like these? You get involved with worshipping Baal. That'll secure good rain for your crops. And then you can keep worshipping the Lord and all the other stuff and all the the benefit that you get from that. It's a win-win situation. Now, you'll have had the odd person tell you to stop worshipping Jesus. Maybe the family member who thinks you've lost your mind, or the friend who thinks you're wasting your life. But most people who aren't Christians won't have tried to persuade you to give up on your faith. But they will have tried to persuade you, subtly or not so subtly, to worship something or someone else alongside Jesus. Just like the Israelites were told, yes, worship the Lord, but you need to look to Baal for the rain and for your crops to prosper. We're told something very similar. Yes, by all means, worship Jesus, 
But to be really happy, you need to, you need to have a nice home, a car that makes a statement. That's really important. Yes, worship Jesus, but don't let him ruin your career. You're so talented. You've got such good prospects, but you'll need to give it 110%. Nothing else will do. Don't let, don't let your God stuff damage your career. Or yes, worship Jesus. But of course, you need to have sexual fulfillment. Otherwise, you're just going to be so frustrated. I doubt anyone said to you, come and worship Baal with me. But that's exactly what they're saying when they say that you need more than Jesus. The Baal worship that was taking place under King Ahab was drawing people further and further away from the Lord. Verse 34, in his days, so in the days of Ahab, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, what's going on here? Something over 500 years previously, the Israelites had entered the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. If you know the book of Joshua, you'll know the account of how Joshua and his mighty men of valor marched round the city of Jericho for six days, and on the seventh day, as they blew their trumpets, they conquered Jericho and raised the city to the ground. And we're told how Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. But in the time of King Ahab, what God had said hundreds of years previously didn't seem that important. And Jericho, well, it was in a strategic position, seemed a bit of a waste to have it just just standing idly by. It was Heel who set about rebuilding the city, but the writer of Kings wants us to understand that he did so because that is how things were in the days of Ahab. That's why rebuilding Jericho was contemplated. And exactly what God, through Joshua, had warned would happen, did happen. Joshua had said, at the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation. And when Heel laid the foundation of Jericho, his firstborn son Abiram died. You'd have thought that would be enough to make him stop. Joshua had warned, at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. But Heel set up Jericho's gates, and his youngest son Segub died. One family's tragedy, but it stood for the tragedy of the whole nation, where the warning of God's word was taken as being insignificant. And it was into that situation that Elijah stepped. God's people, led by an evil king, compromised in their worship, lackadaisical in their obedience, and heading towards judgment. And Elijah makes quite the entrance. Chapter 17, verse 1, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Boom! Stick that in your pipe and smoke it, Ahab. Now, just in case you're thinking that surely Elijah must have been on the scene before this, it's just that we've jumped into the middle of 1 Kings, let me assure you he doesn't. This is his first mention. And it is, you've got to admit, the most dramatic of entries. You can almost imagine, after the encounter, King Ahab sitting shell-shocked in his palace in Samaria, calling his royal advisors and saying, who was that? Uh, we, we, We think he's called Elijah, your majesty. And what do we know about him? Um, we don't know anything about him. He's just said to me, it won't rain for years unless he says so, and we don't know anything about him. Look him up on Wikipedia. 
Very, very good, Your Majesty. What, 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 one moment. Ah, ah, yes, here it is. What does it say? What does it say? What does it say? Elijah the Tishbite. Yes, yes, yes. Where does he come from? Believed to come from Tishbe in Gilead. Tishbe? Where's Tishbe? Uh, let me click. Exact location unknown, Your Majesty. Rubbish. What else does it say? Early life? Nothing, Your Majesty. Education and training? Nothing, Your Majesty. Prophetic influences then. I'm afraid, Your Majesty, there's nothing else listed. We simply don't know about this man. And yet, what Elijah says, short and pithy, is full of impact. Let's, let's unpick what he says. He says that his words are as certain as that the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. In other words, what he says is completely certain. Elijah says that he, Elijah, stands before the Lord... And by saying that, he's saying that he is the Lord's servant and the Lord's mouthpiece. What he's bringing to King Ahab isn't his own personal opinion, but what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. And it is that there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. You want it to rain? You need me standing here saying it will rain. And then what does Elijah do? Well, at God's word, he goes away from Ahab to a place he can't be found. The word of the Lord came to him, verse 2, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the book Cherith, which is in the east, which is east of the Jordan. He said there won't be rain by his word and then he disappears so that his word can't be given. Now in the middle of January in the UK, the prospect of no rain may sound an extremely appealing prospect. But an extended period without rain would be devastating. And that is exactly what Elijah says is going to happen. We read in verse 7, just beyond what was read for us, that there was no rain in the land, just as Elijah said would happen. Now why this? Why no rain or dew except by Elijah's word? Why this prolonged period of drought in Israel? Well, we've got to see the connection between what happens at the beginning of chapter 17 and what we've already seen at the end of chapter 16. Of course, the the chapter divisions aren't there in the original. There's no break between the two parts. The drought announced by Elijah comes as a direct result of the idolatry of King Ahab and the disobedience to God that was flourishing in his reign. Baal in charge of the rain and blessing the crops, the Lord is going to show in unmistakable terms that that is nonsense. Baal is no God at all. Whether or not there's rain or dew has nothing to do with Baal, it's down to the Lord. He is the one who controls all things, including the rain and the dew. And because of the idolatry of his people, the Lord announces through Elijah that rain and dew will be withheld. The God of the Bible is the one true God. He withheld the rain and miraculously sustained Elijah with water from the brook and by food brought by ravens. What the Israelites needed to see then And what we need to see now is that the God of the Bible is the one true God. Three things flow from that. The God of the Bible is the one true God. So worship him alone. As we've seen, the the issue with the Israelites wasn't that they were worshipping Baal instead of the Lord, but they were worshipping Baal as well as the Lord. And the Lord shows clearly and unmistakably that that is not okay. Now, to be a follower of Jesus means that we worship him and him alone. Nothing and no one else should receive the affections and the honour and the love that should be God's. So let me ask you, what is the Baal in your life? The thing you've convinced yourself you need as well as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Elijah announcing drought because of idolatry shows you clearly that if there is an idol in your life to which you are giving worship as well as the Lord, you need to turn from it and worship the God of the Bible and him alone. The God of the Bible is the one true God. So worship him. Secondly, obey him. In 874, the command not to rebuild Jericho, given by God over 500 years before, it might have seemed a bit irrelevant. A command almost for another era, surely not not still relevant today. Heel of Bethlehem would have been congratulated by many as he said about rebuilding Jericho. Uh, He'd have been congratulated as being in touch with present realities, not bound by the past and what's gone before, but, but willing to do things in a contemporary way. But God had commanded it. Jericho was not to be rebuilt. Heel's disobedience showed that he thought that the Lord wasn't really a big factor. What he said, it didn't matter. He could be ignored. And Heel found out to his considerable cost that the Lord could not be ignored. Brothers and sisters, if you're doing the same, if there's an area in your life where deliberately you're ignoring and disobeying what God commands, please would you heed the warning of Heel? Not that your children are going to be wiped out by it, when, but, but disobeying God matters. It's a serious thing. We're not saved by obeying what God commands. So we'll be celebrating in a few minutes in the Lord's Supper. We're saved by the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We're not saved by obedience, but we are saved for obedience. We're saved by God in order that we might then obey him and honour him. If you're disobeying God, don't trifle with him. The God of the Bible is the one true God. So worship him alone, obey him. Thirdly, pray fervently to him. In the New Testament letter of James, it says this, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Now, it might not be the application that you and I would instantly take from 1 Kings 17, mainly because we're not actually told that Elijah prayed for it not to rain. But that's what the Holy Spirit revealed to James was what happened. Elijah, as we read 1 Kings 17, might seem very unlike us. And as we'll see in future weeks, there's there's an extent to which that's true, that he is unlike us. But James says to us, no, he was a man with a nature like ours. Why did it not rain for three and a half years? Because Elijah prayed that it wouldn't, and God answered that prayer. So, says James, the prayer of a righteous person has great power. If you're trusting Jesus, you are righteous. You've been made righteous by him. You've been given the perfect righteousness of Jesus, and so your prayers have great power. As you look back over the last year, 2021, a year we'll look back on with such fondness, not. But as you look back over the last year, which is the bigger issue? Is it that things that you prayed for didn't happen, or is it that you didn't pray for things? Which is the bigger issue? Did you pray for things and they didn't happen? Or did you not pray for things? I've got to be honest, for me, it's the latter. My repeated prayerlessness, it's a much bigger issue. Let's allow this account of what happened through Elijah in 1 Kings 16 and 17. Let's allow it to cause us to get stuck into consistent, regular, fervent persistent prayer. There's nothing in the Bible that says you need to make New Year's resolutions, 
but it can be a helpful chance to reset where you need to. It's only January the 9th today. If over the last year or over much longer, you've slipped into being lazy and lackadaisical in your prayer life. Well, see how God answered Elijah's fervent prayers. And let that kickstart you to get going again in your own prayer life. The God of the Bible is the one true God. So worship him alone, obey him, pray fervently to him. I'm going to leave a few moments of quiet. Use it to turn to the Lord in prayer and I will then lead us in a prayer in a moment or two. Lord God Almighty, thank you for showing us in this passage that you are the one true God. There is no one else. There is none like you. And where that has not been reflected in our lives and our attitudes, please would you forgive us through our Lord Jesus and please would you change us. May we please be people who don't worship idols alongside you but who worship you alone. You don't trifle with your word, but obey you and all that you command. May we be a people who are fervent in prayer, knowing that our prayers are powerful, not because we have power, but because you are the one true God. So please be at work in us for your own praise and glory. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and sing in response to that. Uh, The next song we're singing reminds us that there is no other name in which we can be rescued. There's no other name by which we can be saved because there's no other God. So let's stand and sing and celebrate the salvation he brings in Jesus.
Please take your seats. Well, the next thing or part of the service that we come to is a celebration of the Lord's Supper, which is a great occasion because we often hear the words of the good news of Jesus saves preached to our ears, but in the Lord's Supper we get to hear that, or at least preach to our senses, our hands, our mouths. The Lord graciously gives us these ways because we often forget, don't we, just how real the salvation that Jesus brings is. And just as as real as the bread and the wine that we're going to have in our hands is before us, that's how real the salvation Jesus brings is. Just as certain as we hold the bread and we drink the wine, that is how certain we can be that Jesus really does rescue those who turn to him. It is a meal for believers, for those who are trusting in Jesus as their Lord, as the one who rescues them and are wanting to follow him. People who aren't perfect, because we are not perfect. People who are very aware that they mess up and sin, and yet are relying on Jesus as the only way to be rescued. If that is something that describes you, then please do take part in this meal. If in your heart you know that isn't you, then please just let the bread and the wine pass you by. Don't feel embarrassed. You're always welcome here at Emmanuel. But why not respond to Jesus? Why not take the salvation that he offers? Why not say, Lord, I recognise that I am messed up. I need you. That the things I've done wrong upset you. I turn from them. Why not say, Lord, please will you make me your child? And he will. In some churches, it's traditional to remind ourselves of truths of what we believe and when we take the Lord's Supper. And I'm going to read some words to you. And why not think about them as I read them? The Lord's Supper reminds us of Christmas and Easter all rolled into one. We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man. Two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us. Crucified, dead, and buried, he rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us, for us, he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags of sin and clothed us in his righteous robe. He is our prophet, our priest, and our king, building his church, interceding and praying for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. Those are true words. Well, as we begin, let's turn to God now. Let us confess our need of him as I say these words, and why not follow in your hearts and in your minds as I read them. Ezra 8 tells us that the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So let us seek God and his grace and mercy. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making heirs, us heirs of eternal life in your Son, Jesus Christ, who has freed us from our sin by his blood, yet we still fail to love you with all our heart or serve you as we ought. Pardon our offences, we pray, and make us clean that we may continue as members of Christ 
in whom alone is salvation. Amen. In a second, we're going to sing songs and uh, a song. And while that's being sung, the uh, bread and wine are going to be distributed. It's just normal bread and normal wine. There's nothing special about it. It's non-alcoholic wine. If you want gluten-free bread, um, please let the uh, distributors know and they will give that to you. If we can hold on to the bread and wine until the song's finished and then we'll open when I tell you the bread. Let's stand and sing.
please do take your seats. If you'd like to open the bread part of the, uh, your communion package. I'm going to read some words. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in his time on earth, lived a perfect sinless life. So on the night he was betrayed, he was able to take bread, and when he had given thanks, he could break it and say, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We eat this bread to share in the body of Christ. Let's eat together. Let's open the wine part of our package. In the same way, after supper, he could take the cup and say, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it uh, to remember me. We drink this cup and together we say, to share in the blood of Christ. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Well, we're going to end now by singing a song that reminds us of what God is like and is really a song of commitment to follow Jesus. So let's stand and sing.
Please do take your seats. Well, that's the end of the formal part of our service, but please do hang around. Um, there's coffee and tea through uh, the hallway over there. Um, please do remember to keep your masks on as you move around the hall and also in the, um, the dining area as well. Um, and you are allowed to take them off to drink, but please put them back on. Thank you. Let's finish with a prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much that you are the one true God, the living God, the God who is so gracious that he reveals himself to us and that you have come and you have rescued us. Thank you so much, Father, for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that through him we can know you. Through him we have an eternity which is worth looking forward to. And Father, I pray that whatever things that might be uh, other idols in our hearts, please would you help us to put those aside. In this week ahead, Lord, would you help us to obey you, to worship you only, and to pray to you. Help us, Lord, not to forget what we've heard this morning, but would you use it to grow us and make us more like Jesus. And now, may Jesus, the true saviour of the world, who died for us and is seated in glory at the right hand of the Father, dwell in your hearts by his Holy Spirit, making you fully alive in him through a living faith and perfect love. Amen.